Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media. Welcome to today's webinar on health and safety in industry and mining in partnership with Electromining Africa, South Africa's biggest trade exhibition since 1972. Our panel of industry experts will discuss advancing health and safety in South Africa's industries and mining sector. Today's webinar is sponsored by RAND Mutual Assurance, Sarex Engineering Group, and Alcohol Breathalyzers. We thank them for making this event possible. Before we start, please note that we've activated the Q&A function for your questions. Please direct any questions to the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. While we may not get to every question during our hour together, rest assured we'll review each one. Additionally, the chat feature is enabled for your comments and insights. Look for it right next to the Q&A box. Remember though, questions should go into the Q&A to ensure that they are properly addressed in that section. Please be informed that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available to you afterwards. We are also broadcasting live on YouTube and the link will be shared in the chat once it becomes accessible. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Dr. Sanjay Manu, the Chief Business Development Officer at the Federated Employers Mutual Assurance Company, or FEM. He is the chairperson for various committees and is the president and a fellow chartered member of the South African Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Dr. Manu will facilitate the discussion with our panel, which consists of Dr. Jessica Hutchings, Head of Prevention for COID and Operations at Rand Mutual Assurance, Chris Campbell, the CEO of Consulting Engineers South Africa, Ingrid Osborne, the co-founder and CEO of Sarex Engineering Group, and Dushen Naidu, Head of Safety and Sustainable Development at Minerals Council South Africa. Before our discussion gets underway, I'd like to tell you more about our partner for this webinar, Specialized Exhibitions Montgomery, the organizer of Electromining Africa Exhibition. Electromining Africa is taking place from 2 to 6 September at Johannesburg Expo Center in Nazareth. Electromining Africa, with five decades of accumulated experience since its inaugural show, has built a strong reputation for its ability to connect people and industries, buyers and sellers. For more information, visit their website at www.electromining.co.za. And without further ado, I'll hand over now to our facilitator, Dr. Sanjay Manu, to take the proceedings forward. Over to you, Sanjay. Yeah, th thank you very much, Shannon, and uh, good afternoon to the delegates, and thank you to Klima Media for arranging this webinar. So disruption coupled with innovation has been the norm of recent. Uh, consequently, post the pandemic, the global wars is the global economy is now in complete disarray with escalation of wars, recession, inflation rates, fuel prices, and worsening food shortages. So South Africa has its fair share of challenges coupled with low, well, you know, deepening crisis of unemployment. The execution of uh, and implementation of health and safety measures during these challenging times is definitely a critical uh, aspect for health and safety practitioners and requires commitment from the workforce. Right, um, We have a capable panel uh, panel here today and hoping that they will be able to share, uh, shed some light on these issues. We have uh, Dr. Jessica Hutchings and uh, Dr. Jessica, in your opinion, what are the main causes uh, of injuries in South Africa uh, in the metal industry and other industry. Thanks, Sanjay, and good afternoon to to all the the listeners. So, um, Rand Mutual Assurance it obviously administers workmen's compensation for diseases and injuries in the metal space and the mining sector. Um, if we look at the type of injuries that we, we receive, largely from an occupational disease perspective, noise-induced hearing loss remains to be um, one of the top occupational diseases, both in the mining and the metal sector. And then obviously your more your soft tissue injuries, such as um, sinusitis, tenosynovitis, um, we get a, a carpal tunnel syndrome as well. And then in terms of the actual injuries, uh, in particular in the metal space, we get a lot of foreign body objects to the eye. I mean, you can imagine in this type of industry where welding, et cetera, um, a lot of dust environments, um, we get open wound to the fingers and, and the thumbs, a lot of injuries to the wrist and hand, and then obviously sprain and strains in terms of the, the lumbar spine. 
uh, in the mining sector, it's still um, obviously still very manually driven in terms of the type of injuries we find in the mining sector, but we also find other injuries such as respiratory conditions. We get um, a lot of damage to the ears, also low, lower limb uh, strain and strain injuries um, to the ankle and the lumbar spine as well. So there's a commonality across these industries, and I think that is representative of the type of work that we see, which is still largely uh, manu manually driven. Um, these industries, as much as we're trying to do modernization and mechanization, still uh, rely very much on, on people. And as a result, it has a, a major impact in terms of injuries and then obviously your your occupational diseases which develop over time and um, mining is more exposed to uh, diseases as a result of heat exposure so heat exhaustion and uh, heat cramps are still quite prominent in in the mining in sector thank you uh, jessica and maybe to move to Duchenne from the minerals council south africa so what are the major health and safety challenges that south africa's uh, mining industry still faces and how should these challenges be addressed Greetings, Sanjay, and hello to everyone on the call. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, in the mining industry, we've had um, over 270 loss of lives in 1993. And um, the industry has come a long way in that respect. You know, um, obviously, our drive is to get to zero harm. Um, we've managed to reduce the number of lives by 80%. So currently... Um, you know, well, at the end of 2023, we had 55 loss of life. So we still have a long way to go. There's, there's many challenges. Uh, safety is very, very convoluted in terms of the mitigation measures to alleviate the numbers. Um, and our drive towards zero harm in, in, involves a multi-dimensional or multifaceted approach rather. Uh, the key or the main agencies that we've um, seen as, as major contributors to the loss of lives are the fall of ground uh, challenges that we experience on predominantly our platinum and gold mining uh, sectors and also the transport and machinery sector, which also accounts for, for numerous losses. Um, so those are the key agencies that contribute to, to our fatalities and injuries to, to some extent. Um, there's also a lot that we've seen in the last uh, year, or rather this year for that matter, on the, on the machinery side, specifically on conveyors. Um, so we've seen an increase in conveyors this year, which is not really a common thing uh, given the previous performance. Um, so, so these are some of the major challenges in the industry at the moment. Fall of ground, transport and machinery. There's a lot of general injuries and also associated fatalities. Uh, also, general is a category that, that talks to falling from heights, falling into all passes, getting struck by uh, tools and that sort of thing. Um, so these are some of the major challenges. Um, there's, there's numerous other as, uh, aspects to, to safety and improving uh, safety on our in, in our mining sector. Uh, but I won't go on and on about that. I'll, I'll give the others a chance. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, uh, Dushan. But maybe just to find out, what's your personal view on, um, do you think zero accidents are possible on that month? Do you? I absolutely think zero accidents are possible. Um, we've seen it in other industries, in other sectors, and we're trying to learn from those industries. Um, so essentially, I believe that the interventions and the initiatives that we have in place as a Minerals Council of South Africa, uh, from the perspective of our fall of ground action plan, so it's very much a research and development project where the mining companies have invested heavily into it, uh, to come up with solutions to the issues at hand. And then um, we have a lot of um, collabor collaborative workings with international entities as well, not just uh, on the local space, but internationally with experts who have said that um, control effectiveness and managing it is really uh, the key to getting to, um, to, to, to mitigate um, you know, some of these incidents by effectively managing controls you can reduce the number of uh, incidents you have on site by managing leading indicators, by assessing your data and, and adjusting the, the, the goal as we, we move towards that zero. I think that's the key. So I think it is absolutely possible. Uh, we've said, we've, we've seen from our safety milestone analysis 
that the industry has improved uh, over the 10 year period, uh, not as much as we would have wanted to in terms of you know, some of the unrealistic milestones that were set initially. But uh, from, a, from a logical perspective and from an analytical point of view, we've actually reduced the, the number of incidents on, on our mining sector in South Africa. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Dushin. Um, yeah, so maybe we'll move next to Chris uh, from the Consulting Engineers South Africa. But before uh, I yeah, move to you, Chris, maybe from my perspective, so I've uh, been quite uh, close to the George incident. And in fact, I actually traveled to the site when the building collapsed. And I must say it was absolute um, a disaster site and lots of um, people lost their lives, right? I mean, it's, it's something that we can't definitely... Um, uh, move forward from, and maybe from the consulting engineer's perspective, um, you know, what should the country learn from that incident? And um, yeah, maybe how do we prevent further incidents from occurring? Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you, Sanjay, and uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I think, you know, it's it's really, you know, the loss of life in the incident and in George um uh is the most unfortunate event but i think what's important for us to realize is um it was purely because of the timing that that made its way into mainstream media to the extent that it did are accidents similar to these happening on a regular basis there is no doubt and that's the problem so george was maybe a major symptom is 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 symptomatic of, of a greater problem. Um, I mean, just down the road there was another incident in Belito, um, and and people often you know there's this notion that oh it's minor so it, it's not newsworthy. Yet in the Belito incident, and I'll comment on the George further, but in the Belito incident, um, a collapse of an excavation. Um, certainly, and not having been personally involved in any of the investigations, but one would have hoped that there was somebody on site supervising and ensuring that the construction regulations that relate to safety and excavations was there to inform the workforce, not leaving the workforce on their own uh, exposed. Um, it's, it's you know, for time immemorial, any excavation um, beyond about a meter, there would have to be measures taken because that risk is there of that kind of collapse. Now, if we, if we go across to, and in fact, by the way, there was another incident in Limpopo also, you know, and uh, I, I think we, it, what, what, what needs to happen is more of these incidents need to be reported so that one can address what not only the root causes, but what is the role of all the parties? Now, if we take a George incident, um, and this is no defense of the individual who was named first. Now, now that's not the right way to go because in any construction project, there is a client, there's a contractor, there are multiple disciplines of engineering, uh, of, of, of uh, built environment practitioners involved in the project. And the fact that it's a structural collapse does not imply necessarily immediately that the engineer is at fault. It should be left to the entire investigation because the fact of the matter is that if there were changes made and there is a team, then firstly, there should be a duty of care. Uh, exercised by all, uh, all professionals, and even more importantly, the client and the contractor. So, you know, there are multiple parties, and, and I think more needs to be done to educate all the parties on what's their roles and responsibilities and not assume that it is any one party's responsibility on their own. Um, uh, you know, so... I, I think from from the that particular incident, uh, firstly, with, there needs to be, uh, and and what is clear, uh, if I may add, is it doesn't help 
for us to it depend, for example, on the Department of um, uh, what's it, uh, Labor and Employment uh, inspectors to come and catch you out. There's construction regulations that apply to who's responsible, what's the you know levels of responsibility, and 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 who's supposed to do what. So it exists in law, and and best the parties all be uh, ensure that they're educated on that, and 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 stick to the rules of the game, because that they design to help protect everyone. Um, you know, to to hope that uh, you know uh, there's enough inspectors, by the way, which there aren't. And the other aspect is, are there enough knowledgeable inspectors? Is there even another uh, you know a part of the e equation? And we shouldn't be depending on the stick. We should rather use the carrot and the duty of care perspective in all of these, um, because human life, health and safety is the primary objective. Uh, the preservation thereof that is. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I, I fully agree that, you know, there shouldn't be any pointing of fingers and, and you know, hopefully the Department of Employment and Labor through the investigations will be able to arrive at some sort of uh, conclusion and the individuals who have transgressed any regulations or laws uh, will be held accountable. But maybe from a consulting engineer's uh, perspective, what sort of action have you taken as an organization uh, to bring to the attention of your members and also to... Yeah, and maybe in your opinion, do you feel that there's, a, you know, the industries where you mentioned the uh, client, the contractor, the engineers, et cetera, do you believe there's any sort of fragmentation and you think going forward we need to collaborate a bit closer uh, with each other? Thank you. Um, so maybe firstly on what we're we doing. Um, well, I'm in this webinar today uh, and and uh, several others which and, and and media articles which we have published post that incident as well. Um, on, you know, what would be the 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 preferred route to be taking, and what's the importance and relevance of uh, the construction regulations, which do exist, and 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 I think that also we've got a very active school of consulting engineering. We present health and safety uh, training courses, not to the extent where you certify people, but to at least raise the awareness of the role of all practitioners. And to that extent, we certainly advocate for the proactive inclusion of health and safety professionals at the design stages in projects. I think all too often that expertise is not taken account of enough, and we tend to leave it to... Uh, it, it tends to be relegated to health and safety officers on a construction site who may not have the necessary expertise. You know, often it's, it's a paper exercise. Um, you tick boxes uh, on, you know, do you have safety talks? Yes. Do you do this, et cetera, et cetera. But I think there's a whole lot more to it and a lot more risks that the health and safety professionals in conjunction with all the other built environment practitioners involved in these kind of projects could bring to the party proactively as opposed to us having to deal with the unfortunate um, uh, consequences of, of um, you know, failure in, in, in adhering to health and safety measures. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, I think that will then lead us to the next uh, uh, panelist uh, Ingrid Osborne from Cerex Engineering Group. And I think it's an opportune time as well, uh, Ingrid, in terms of what role can um, artificial intelligence and other technologies, technologies play in improving occupational health and safety in South Africa? Yeah, thanks, Sanjay. Absolutely. AI and other advanced technologies um, significantly improve occupational health and safety. And there are several ways in which these technologies can be applied. Um, your AI algorithms analyze vast amount of data from workplace incidents. They identify patterns um, and predict potential hazards before they occur. Machine learning models can be trained to recognize unsafe conditions and predict the likelihood of future accidents based on historical data. IoT devices, these sensors can be deployed across the workplace um, to continuously monitor environmental conditions, air quality, 
temperature, noise levels, um, wearable technology. Um, you know, wearables are equipped with sen sensors that can monitor workers' um, workers' vital signs, detect falls, alert them to potential dangers such as harmful gases or extreme temperature. And then there's been um, real advancement in virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, and they can be used for immersive training programs. So simulating dangerous um, scenarios um, in a safe environment. And this really helps workers learn how to handle emergencies and practice safe protocols without the real world risks. Um, AI powered learning platforms, personalized training modules um, for workers. And then of course, we it just naturally, you know, rolls over to incident reporting and management. So mobile apps and platforms like HSEC Online, we'll talk about a bit later, um, provide streamlined um, reporting of safety incidences, hazards, or near misses. And these can analyze and identify trends and then possibly suggest preventive measures. Automated documentation. I mean, it can help maintain and organize compliance documents so that you know, we ensure that all safety protocols are, um, are followed and inspections are up to date and that they're easily accessible during audit, um, audits. And there are many other applications, but the benefits of implementing AI and other technologies is so obvious. You get an increase in regulatory compliance. So this ensures that you adhere to the South Africa's occupational health and safety regulations, mining regulations, and really reduces the risk of legal um, legal penalties and improving worker welfare. You get economic efficiency, so reducing costs associated with workplace accidents, such as medical expenses, compensation plan um, claims, downtime, those hidden costs that we don't necessarily see. And I think the most important is worker morale and retention. By implementing these solutions, digital, digital solutions, enhances worker confidence um, in the workplace. Um, and that leads to better retention rates and attracts, um, you know, the skilled labor we all we all looking for. Thanks, Ingrid. Um, I recall writing an article a few years ago, and I think, uh, you know, some of the concerns that may come up from your health and safety practitioner, right, from an AI perspective, and you hear about it taking over a number of different uh, career paths, etc. What is your sort of view with AI and the health and safety practitioner? Do you think it's there to take over their jobs or is it there to augment uh, their, their jobs? Absolutely not. It's a tool. It's a tool to facilitate a better job. That's that's what it does. Um, you know, you can track, you, you can try and track your health and safety uh, in a manual level arch file, but it doesn't tell you anything. You have to go looking for it. Um, and that's generally after the fact. We want a system that actually alerts us to the necessary actions we need to, to take in order to remain compliant. So I look at it as an essential tool. There is no other way around it. Um, digitization has to happen, and it's proved to decrease um, incidents and accidents in the work workplace. Yes. So I also think that, you know, part of the discussions have had uh, the health and safety files. You've mentioned, you know, how do we get it into an electronic format? And I think if you look at a health and safety file being about 300 to 400 pages, what sort of um, initiatives uh, do we need to engage with the relevant uh, authorities, maybe Department of Employment and Labor as well? to try and get these health and safety files more onto an electronic format. Because I think what we do find, and as I think Chris mentioned a bit earlier, you get a tick box exercise or you have a health and safety file that's used from site to site, not uh, adhering to the site specifications for that matter. Um, how do we then you know, perhaps look at uh, implementation of uh, electronic health and safety files? So <clears throat> I wonder if I could actually speak directly to HSEC Online as a product. You know. I think that it's a cultural change that needs to occur. And I think all stakeholders need to participate. Generally speaking, a solution is created that's not accessible to perhaps, you know, smaller contracting companies on site. We want to digitize all of those stakeholders across the workplace. And once you get ownership in terms of a digital solution within an organization, and you're able to share that with clients, that information with clients, suddenly there's transparency. There's a digital platform where you can be transparent in terms of what your compliance looks like. And it drives compliance down to the contractor level, 
which is, you know, really important. They're on site probably more than anyone on, on big projects. So um, a, di a, a transparent digital solution for all sta stakeholders is a game changer. When all stakeholders involved, when they own their own HSEC online licenses, for example, that creates responsibility and accountability. And I think the digitization process just needs to start. It just needs to start. Um, and once you're there, it's almost like internet banking. You never ever go back to that branch again. You know, it's it's just so efficient and effective. Great, thank you, uh, Ingrid. And uh, back to you, Dr. Hutchings. From an RMA perspective, and how have you partnered with the stakeholders to take uh, coordinated action to reduce workplace injuries and fatalities? Uh, thanks, Sanjay. I was actually just going to make a comment on Ingrid's um, last comment, but I think yeah. um, definitely, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I think one doesn't appreciate the, the roles and responsibilities that are are expected of a health and safety professional. And often, you know, they become the, the jack of all trades. Uh, and I think something for me is, it's, you know, when we deal a lot with the safety professionals from the RMA prevention program, and you just, you do kind of sympathize with these guys because they become the, the all for when it comes to safety. And they're actually a support function to business. Um, you know, line management needs to actually take accountability when it comes to, to health and safety that, um, you know, it's not the always the job of the safety professionals that are expected to do everything. And I think that's where the administrative burden becomes so much on the on the health and safety professional that often they can't get outside to do their inspections, to do their audits because of the the literally the load that gets given to them. So I think to Ingrid's point, if we can digitize and automate and you know ease that administrative load that is placed on them, we would be getting greater visibility outside where they actually do need to be making a difference and sitting in an office just trying to, you know, capture information, statistics. Um, um, so that was the point I wanted to make on, on that, just, you know, giving some kudos to the health and safety professionals because there is a huge expectation on them. Um, but to your point, um, so our, Rand Mutual Assurance has a prevention program, which is um, a program that we offer to our, our metals industry as a pilot. Um, and we really believe at looking at health, safety and wellness and not just, um, you know, health and safety. I think today in this day and age, we, people are really feeling, you know, the load of, of mental health, the socioeconomic situation, the financial stresses. So all of that places, a, you know, a load on, on employees and has an impact in terms of accidents and incidents. So for us to really be effective with our program, we have to be able to work from a top down, bottom up. Um, so the stakeholders are, are crucial, and that could be anything from the employer, who we work with as our direct client, and the employees, and then a very important part of the, the ecosystem is the, the unions as well. Um, love them or hate them, they um, can be people's foes or friends, but they have a significant role in terms of driving health and safety amongst their employee base. Um, and then obviously in terms of um, working very closely with um, different organizations, I mean, Dushindra and the, and the Minerals Council, they've got a huge amount of research that's been done in the field. Um, obviously, for example, our sister association, FEM, the Department of Employment and Labor. So every single stakeholder has a role to play. And I think Chris alluded to it earlier is that I do feel we're still working in silos and that there isn't a collective um, mandate to really prevent, to drive health and safety, um, whether that's a conversation for today or another day, but something I really strongly feel we need to do as a, as a collaborative effort. Yeah, thank you for that, um, Jessica. So, yeah, I think in terms of Duchenne, you know, Jessica mentioned uh, the Minerals Council. And over the years, health and safety levels have improved in South Africa, in the South African mining industry. And uh, what have been, has been the driving forces uh, of this improvement? Thank you, Sanjay. Um, I think a lot of the driving forces uh, lean on really the industry coming together. So in the past, a lot of mining companies would, would look, um, you know, there, there would be incidents on sites. And very often, some of the lessons learned and some of the um, the sharings, you know, it, it, it happened on a very, very small scale. Um, so currently we have, uh, you know, much better collaboration between mining companies and the other stakeholders, uh, including the government, the unions, 
uh, supplier community as well. So, so a lot on the technical on the technological side um, has been, you know, sort of all of these entities have been facilitated, you know, through the Minerals Council, we've, we've facilitated a lot of these conversations. And some of the initiatives include, you know, the Fall of Ground Action Plan, um, that has so many, well, it has a, has a, the designated pillars to address all of the complexities of around fall of ground. And then if you look at um, our Kumbalakaya strategy, you know, that was the, fir- the first version came out just around 2019. And that's where we saw quite a steep dip uh, just afterwards um, in terms of the incidents. Uh, also in um, another big measure was the Stop the Bleeding campaign. So as part of CEO, CEO ship, um, the CEOs came up with eight actions to stop the bleeding. And in 2022, we actually saw some of that impact, um, you know, from those actions. It, it reduced to from 74 uh, fatalities in 2021 to 49 in 2022. So a lot of these interventions are certainly having an impact. It's just that, uh, you know, we obviously want to accelerate things quickly to get to zero. Um, but, you know, realistically, that aspirational target is going to take place over time due to some of the, the you know, some of the items that Ingrid and, and Dr. Jessica mentioned. You know, digitization is now coming into the foreplay. Uh, we are looking at a whole project around, uh, you know, attaining data from our members. And some of that key data, okay, it's lagging indicators that, that give you a perspective on what happened, you know, in terms of some of the agencies. But at the same time, we're looking at the leading indicators. We're transforming from, from, from leading indicators to look at actual proactive actions that can be implemented on site in terms of you know, better controls and, and better initiatives. So there's a lot of safety interventions that have also been instituted by the individual companies. And very often we don't, you know, we don't see or um, you know, we, we don't see on an individual company basis how that has actually taken form. We're running a mini project now around our safety milestones to look at learning from successes because there might have been, you know, we, we've, we might have seen a lot of um, incidents over the past years, but, but there has been some good work in the safety space that has actually reduced the fatalities, that's reduced incidents and injuries. So we want to learn from that. You know, very often the learning is not shared, uh, but through our committees, like learning from incidents committees, and our CEO ship, um, you know, our, our CEO ship collaborative spaces, uh, we have shares every month, you know, within our CEO Zero Harm Forum. We have shares uh, through our boards, our, our board hour of learning. So this is leadership that we need, you know, it's, it's, it's the leadership we need to drive that change. And, and that's actually being seen. There's robust, um, there's much more robust collaboration in the industry. Uh, in terms of the root causes, the contributing factors to incidents, um, all of that is being shared. And, and members are actually doing this quite freely, uh, even with the sensitivities of, uh, you know, the loss of life on site. Um, I think the whole industry is coming together and putting their hands together to stop the bleeding, which, which is, um, it, it's quite encouraging. It's, it's um, for, for, you know, being, being passionate about safety, as we all are, I think that's what we want. We want to collaborate, we want to find solutions, and we want to proactively drive change. And through technology, through digitization, like what Ingrid mentioned, we need to acquire that data, do the analysis, and instrument it. We can't just talk about it. We need to instrument it. And I think um, we've, you know, with the Data R Us, uh, we've got a campaign called Data R Us. We're taking this whole thing to another level. We're utilizing the technologies on hand. We are dealing with the regulator, dealing with the unions, and and facing these challenges, and and trying to implement solutions that can be, that can make an impact. And I think, um, you know, a lot of the interventions that have been instituted by mining companies, uh, by by miscellaneous mining companies at large, if we can consolidate those learnings quite quickly, and share them and implement, then we can mitigate and and reduce the the, the numbers. Thanks, uh, Dushan. I think from a Minerals Council South Africa perspective, right, so there's other industries, we've got the forestry, agriculture, we've got the construction industry, we've got the CIDB, which is the Construction Industry Development Board. How do you all engage and interact with with each other? Are there any sort of um, 
conversations around health and safety with these entities? Yeah, we often look at other industries for, for you know, just gauging on some of the interventions that they've instituted. Uh, in the past, uh, some of our colleagues have even spoken to NASA. You know, they've spoken to some of the specialists and the experts, the real intellectuals on, on those ends to, to gain from, from what interventions they've actually laid out. And also internationally, you know, we've got the Vision Zero campaign. So we, we don't just speak to people in the mining sector. We, we talk to people outside. Um, yeah, we talk to, to, to other entities on, on the forestry side, side and agricultural, uh, often also on the, in the manufacturing community and the likes of the automotive sector. We often talk to those entities as well to sort of gauge on, you know, what are some of the actions that they are implementing to, to reduce um, or, or to improve their safety regimes. Um, so, so the conversations definitely happen, you know, just beyond uh, our mining sector. But um, we also like to collabor collaborate with the experts within our, our community because mining is very intricate. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that are very specific to our sector. So there's this and there's a lot of experts around. Um, so we've seen, um, if I can take, for example, the Collision Prevention System project. It's a multifaceted project, you know, that involves the merging of, you know, the DMR suppliers, uh, the MQA, uh, the unions, all of the different stakeholders. Um, and there's a, there's a need. There was actually a, a strong need to get everyone into the same room. And we managed to achieve that. Uh, there's some challenges still, you know, after the regulations got promulgated, um, got lifted, uh, especially in terms of the two TMM regulations. However, um, I think the industry is moving forward with it. And um, a lot of companies have actually, you know, shown the leadership. And before regulations could even be implemented, they, they looked at, you know, getting these technologies on board and trialing it and testing it and, and seeing how they could work for them. And that has improved um, on operations. Of course, you know, with technology introduction, you, you, you also get a lot of uh, uh, complexities. So, so there's a lot involved with that. So, so I think there's a, there's a roadmap that we're paving in terms of all of these streams. And um, yeah, from, from a multifaceted or, or sort of a multi-sectoral approach, as, as you call it, I think we can learn a lot from all of the different dimensions. I think safety is such a wide and such a broad topic um there's a lot we can you know um we can we can definitely streamline a lot of a lot of commonalities if i can say that thank you yeah you know i, I agree with you and i think uh, also of interest as well what we've started doing from a, a data perspective right so we always say that you know when you look at the statistics and you know 50 people have passed away in a year or been killed on site etc or at the workplace and it doesn't necessarily paint a true uh, picture in terms of the pain and suffering that the individual goes through or the families, et cetera. And what we'd call it is it's uh, numbers uh, without tears, right? So I think what will be a good uh, recommendation as well is what we've started, for example, is just to start getting a, the description of the incidents as well and getting real life uh, stories of the dependence of the people who've been killed on site. And the yeah, you know, of course, if somebody's um, seriously injured for example they generally the breadwinner in a family and that has the multiplier effect in terms of affecting a number of other um, individuals in society as well so so definitely from a health and safety uh, perspective very important to ensure compliance on site uh, Sanjay, thanks. Sorry. it's um, yeah. Jessica I just wanted to, to come in I think also one of the things that um, employers or organizations get fixated on is, is, you know, KPIs in this particular space. And it becomes, mm. you know, very difficult when you, when you're measuring safety performance and improvement. Um, and I think to your point, you know, numbers without tears, <laughs> a fatal is not just a scorecard with, you know, we've got one, we've got two, there's, there's a whole ecosystem, there's a community, there's dependence, there's family. So I think as organizations, um, we really need to be, to be better at, not just looking at it from a, a number perspective, but as you say, the narrative around it, the impact that it could have. It's not just one person that's lost their life. That person who's working in a small steelworks could be the breadwinner, but for a family, um, but also the community. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's something that I think as employers, we really do need to be better at not just using safety as a, as a lagging indicator, um, 
also I think someone one of the panelists mentioned you know leading indicators as well but not just numbering putting a number to a life um, I think that's we we're really doing uh, you know a disservice to to our citizens in the country definitely thank you uh, uh, Jessica Sanjay if, if I can add to that as well yeah um, you know as a minerals council we also have um, a sister component uh, to safety called MOSH, and that's the Mining Occupational Safety and Health Department. And what that department looks at is leading practices. So leading practices in fall of ground, in transport and machinery, and also the health aspects like noise and dust. And they've come up with a lot of tools that the industry is currently using. So we try to promote the adoption of these leading practices to also assist the industry in improving uh, on their safety performance. And this has uh, proven well to some extent, and there's a lot we can share in that space. Great. Thanks, Tishi uh, uh, Sanjay, yeah. um, if I may weigh in on uh, this uh, very interesting discussion is, and I think we, we often, we tend to focus on health and safety, uh, and we talk about on-site, which is a ongoing present activity with a future aspiration to finish off some kind of structure or building or whatever. But I think equally important in the realm of health and safety, that same duty of care exists for the owners of all assets, infrastructure assets, because we tend to overlook uh, a disused mine, Slimes Dam collapse. Somebody owned it. People lost their lives. Uh, Limpopo, a disused abandoned uh, building, the roof collapsed, killed a couple of people. And the point I'm trying to make is there needs to be some consequences uh, and, and responsibility taken for the owners of these assets because you can't assume that I'm no longer using it. I can just leave it. It probably it needs to be maintained because people's lives are at stake, even with this used uh, uh, infrastructure that we see uh, all over the show. Thank you. Fully agreed, uh, Chris. Uh, and I think um, of interest, right? So Department of Employment and Labor, and we seem to have the best uh, health and safety legislation in this country. And, and not that I'm picking on South Africa, but I think it's a global phenomenon where we see that millions of people pass away every year as a result of occupational injuries and diseases. And, and I think definitely uh, regulations and legislations are quite pivotal in terms of ensuring uh, the health and safety compliance. But um, do you believe that uh, the um, Occupational Health and Safety Act is being effectively enforced? Uh, if 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 you're targeting me to respond, I'm happy yeah. to do that. Yeah, uh, I was the last speaker, so um, yeah. Look, I think probably not to its fullest extent for for several reasons. There may be a, a, a huge shortage of knowledge and education which needs to be shared. People need to be brought on board. Uh, it's also not uh, of necessity a top-down approach. It has to be bottom-up as well because people who need to be sensitive to the fact that they may find themselves unduly exposed. And so I don't need to be there if you unduly exposing me and you can enforce your rights. Uh, and, and so there's a, a plethora of education that needs to uh, be put in place to assist people. I, for example, I've um, in, in a former uh, environment in a factory itself, uh, we had huge amounts of incidents and a survey of the employees in a production environment, um, quite a dangerous one, um, a precast concrete manufacturing that is. Um, the general attitude of the workforce was completely fatalistic. And it took a lot of work to get through to the hearts and minds of people to move away from that mindset and accept that it is within their hands as well. Yes, the sky may fall on you at any point in time. We don't know if that will ever happen, if you read the little, uh, recall the story when we were little kids. But most of the time in a working environment you can uh you know avoid those kinds of injuries um uh, or, or or risks 
and that's where the education, the um, you know, just sensitizing people to you know the need for uh, general well-being and the fact that you can also look after yourself. You have a duty of care to your family too. Um, and then there's the last one that I think that also needs the myth needs to be dispelled is if you in if you get injured that you may necessarily be compensated by the company and that's not true and it's a it's a it's a horrible myth especially in manufacturing environment that people believe that they may be compensated if and unfortunately it then ends up being proven that they've been negligent so you lose both the finger and you don't get compensated it doesn't help you so I think there's where the old, the you know, the the entirety of the responsibility has to come into play, uh, bottom up and top down. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Chris. Sorry, Sandra, I, I think you, it's, if, it, if I can come in there as well, I think on the Mine Health Mine Health and Safety Act, um, you know, that's the actually the primary regulatory stance for the mining industry. You know, we have to follow the Mine Health and Safety Act. The Occupational uh, Health and Safety Act is also. Um, adhere to to some extent you know depending on the activities on site uh, like construction or manufacturing so that cuts across a broad uh, range of industries but mine health and safety act is our predominant um, look to in terms of regulations i think Thanks, Sandy, uh, sorry just Shadia. also on that i think one of the <clears throat> you know it's a not a contentious point but a question that always keeps coming up is why do we have two different acts in south africa governing health and safety and um, certainly, I know our, our colleagues in the Department of Labor and, and in the DMRE would, you know, have varying opinions. But I think it it does create a little bit of unease because the perception is that the Mine Health and Safety Act is better enforced and better regulated than the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, and that could be to Chris's earlier comments, uh, you know, as to reasons why why it may not be as well enforced. Um, but I think, you know, you, the perception could be because in mining, you've got international shareholders, um, you've got really big brands and companies who don't want to be known, you know, to be seen to be unsafe. Uh, whereas, you know, poor little Jessica and her little steelworks business, you know, is just minor in comparison. So I think we, we do need to, as a, as, a, as a collective, again, you know, start asking questions. Uh, the inspectors from the DMRE can come in Section 54, Section 55 very, very quickly. But I think um, we, we find that perhaps um, health and safety hasn't necessarily been given the, the importance when it comes to the social impact that, that one needs to do from a country perspective. Um, and I think it generally, as a country, we don't enforce. I mean, you can go through a, a red robot, you can bribe a, a policeman if you get a traffic fine. So mm -hmm. I think it's it's a much bigger systemic issue than than what we're talking about today, um, that does really need to be tabled at at um, you know sort of higher up if we really want to make a difference in terms of saving lives, preventing harm and injury, you know, looking after the communities that people serve. So, yeah, I think this really is um, something that runs very deep, and and when we talk about top down, it's not just organizations it's it's the, the the government you know that also needs to play a role here in ensuring that health and safety it's a constitutional right um it is part of everyone's esg campaigns these days um, but are we really living it uh, when it comes to organizational values well you agreed uh, uh, jessica thank you uh, ingrid from the uh, sarix uh, HSEC online solution, how does it help organization keep track of health and safety documents and compliance? Maybe a bit more insight. Thanks. So HSEC online, um, the digital solution, you know, provides businesses of all sizes, and that's really important, and all industries, and that's also really important because we've implemented it in the forestry industry, we've Im implemented in mining, um, food and beverage, bulk material handling, it doesn't really matter um, which industry you're in. Um, you can implement a digital solution um, to, to manage health and safety. But um, ASIC Online has a set of comprehensive tools to effectively manage health and safety documents and ensure compliance. And by centralizing the information, 
automating alerts, facilitating incident reporting and risk management, and offering robust analytics, AFSEC Online can then help these um, organizations maintain a safe work environment, adhere to re regulations and changing regulations, and continuously improve their health and safety performance. And again, it's not just a solution for big corporates, um, but this also empowers contractors to manage their businesses conscientiously. Um, and by being able to share their data, um, the required data to their clients on a digital platform, the clients can then access, um, assess their efforts um, on a centralized digital platform. This transparency ensures that everyone is engaged and, account um, and, and um, accountable. So the HSEC Online platform is all about inclusion, communication, and training. And we recognize that putting reliable systems in to improve health and safety of all involved from the corporate to the contractors, and, and we work together to try and cultivate an understanding um, of what we're trying to achieve here, then we have success. And by engaging all stakeholders, we cultivate honesty. And this leads to transparency. And transparency builds trust, which then reduces fear. And we know that there's a lot of fear when it comes to health and safety, reporting of incidences, near misses, et cetera. So we have had amazing success with the Age Second Line platform because these values are embedded in the product itself. And this is how we become a safer workforce. And Age Second Line is just that a transparent digital platform for all stakeholders within the workplace. Thanks, Ingrid. I'm not sure if you have any particular case study, right? So if you maybe have a company that's been utilizing this particular system and how has that improved uh, the health and safety compliance and has there been a material reduction uh, in, in incidents as well? Absolutely. We did a case study. It was actually published in an article um, a little while ago where um, that company had 100% zero harm for the first time in that year. In addition, they had gone through several audits with absolutely no findings. And I think that this is really, it, it, it really speaks to the success of digital solutions. Um, we human beings, after all, we need to try and reduce human error where we can. And managing compliance is something that we can all, it's, it's, you don't want to spend your time looking, flipping through safety files. You want to be able to be told when something's expired, be able to, you know, act on it prior to that expiry date. We know it's coming up in three weeks' time and this has to be updated. Go and get it done. And having, you know, your health and safety practitioners on site monitoring all these contractors, they can then see when someone's falling below compliance. Start to integrate into access control systems. If your priority one documentations have expired or someone is not fit for purpose in terms of their job description, deny them access at the gate. Start to be proactive in terms of trying to curb, you know, any accidents or incidences that could have been prevented way ahead of time. Thanks, uh, Ingrid. Uh, Jessica, for your, uh, why is it vital that employers ensure that their employees have adequate coverage for occupational injuries and diseases? I think, Sanjay, you know, that, that question is always something I think is, is the obvious, right? Um, I firmly believe people don't come to work to kill themselves. Um, and if they do, you know, that's a psychosocial issue that uh, really needs to be addressed. But I think um, in this country with you know, the stats that we've just shared today, which are really uh, just a, you know, a slither of a cake. We cannot afford to to be losing lives. We've got an economy that we need to to get into place. Um, we've got a gener future generations, you know, to leave uh, legacies behind. So for me, it's it's a no-brainer. We, we want people to come to work in a healthy and safe way, and we want them to return home in the same way. And I think, you know, most companies feel that. I think it's just... Um, given, I think your opening today was all the challenges that we face as a society and what do you balance? You think about, a, uh, I always use the analogy, Jessica Steelworks, that's what do I invest my money in a generator to, to keep my business going because of load shedding or do I spend that money in terms of health and safety? And to us as professionals, we know what you should be doing, but a guy has got to run a business and if he doesn't, he closes the doors, people are in short time already as a result of that. You then create the domino impact of, you know, people losing income, not getting overtime, 
uh, you know, they can't take the same salary. They resort to substances to overcome the financial pressures. They then, you know, have marital issues. It then becomes, you know, mental health issues. So this, this domino impact of, of not creating a health and safety workplace not only impacts how people present themselves at work, but it also impacts on, on how they end up going, you know, back home. So for me, organizations really need to, to, to be, do better at recognizing the benefits of health and safety and having, you know, fit and healthy employees in terms of having safe workplaces, equipment that is safe. I mean, we see a lot in the, in the steel industry, you know, machining, uh, machinery without guarding, um, companies accepting that level of risk, having already lost, uh, have an employee lost three fingers in a previous incident, um, that yet they continue. So what are the value systems when it comes to, you know, our most prized um, assets, our employees? Um, but I think Ingrid has touched on it in terms of, you know, the domino effects of compensation costs, there's legal costs. Um, and then for the employees, right? If they don't feel that their workplace is healthy and safe or they don't feel valued, they become despondent, they get withdrawn, they become perhaps careless at what they're doing because they don't feel valued. So that contributes to, to accidents and incidents. So for me, it's it's something that um, it, it's a no-brainer to all of us as professionals. I just think we really do need to be better at a collective of, of practicing what we preach in terms of making sure that this really is an important business imperative as any other, um, you know, financial means, production, et cetera. So, yeah, I think that's most of the colleagues have already addressed it, but happy if anyone else wants to add to that. Yeah, if yeah, I can add yeah. to that, uh, Sanjay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, Jessica said it uh, quite nicely. I think um, essentially, you know, as safety practitioners, we, we constantly have to look at innovating uh, towards you know, improving things. Um, you know, we looked at company bow ties and bow ties from the perspective of looking at control measures for for that high energy release aspect that, lead, that, that leads to an incident. Um, you know, control failures, mitigating controls. Uh, we're constantly looking at these things and, and consolidating from the industry um, to actually develop, we've actually developed industry bow ties in, in four different areas. And industry is using that to improve on their risk profiles. Um, when you spoke about challenges, some of the challenges that we will have going forward is indeed, you know, as we go deeper into the ground, you know, with the complexity of our ore bodies, the risk profile increases. So that, that also opens another can of worms in terms of, you know, the, 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 what's required to improve safety, uh, especially for underground mines. So that's something we're working on quite proficiently. Um, and there's been a lot of things in terms of advanced, in terms of advanced all body knowledge, seismicity learnings that's really complex, um, you know, leading practices around fall of ground and transport and machinery uh, interventions that, that are actually making that are that are actually making an impact. So these are the things we're looking at promoting, um, you know, from a leading practice perspective and from a case study perspective. Uh, there's, there's numerous aspects like this. Um, and, and I agree with Jessica, you know, that a lot of these things uh, requires the collaborative space. You know, we all need to sort of come together and share these learnings. Um, as a mining industry, we sort of getting there. I think we, we're getting there quite strongly because um, these collaborative spaces and the committees and the leadership forums we have within the Minerals Council actually enhances the conversations, which is quite, quite important. Um, there's a lot of sharing in terms of risk propensity and supervisor turnover. Change management is the big topic nowadays as well. I mean, um, you know, you find people that are leaving the mines and when new people come on, they don't necessarily take on the, you know, the, the, what was left like a electricity diagram for that matter a lot of that is left out of the you know it's not filed properly and it's not carried forward um there's things like contractor management that comes into the fore uh, that's a big problem because contractors that come on need to adopt um the philosophies that the mine has entrenched in their in their personnel and very often that's missed and that leads to incidents so th those are some of the challenges that uh, we're trying to attack um, you know, to, to also help the industry. Fantastic, Dushin. I think I'm one of the uh, challenges... Yeah, Sorry, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think, yeah, definitely, Dushin, I think from a 
Yeah, um, yeah. I just want to make one point. Thanks. So, so I think from a mining perspective, you know, it's, it's generally a well-controlled environment. And, you know, one of the uh, challenges I, I noticed from um, the George incident, right? And it was quite sad. I mean, many of the employees who came to site that day were actually, it was their first day. And many of them were standing on the side of the road. And unfortunately, that oh, was yeah. uh, the last day at work for them, right? And uh I think it's it's definitely a very serious uh, challenge within South Africa. And noting from the general um, high number of unemployed workers, we we have a lot to do in terms of upskilling and training uh, the um, the 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 entire South African economy, right? So to getting them to a, a particular point. So one of the initiatives, for example, where we spoke about many years ago, is how do we get to the schooling environment and start educating the scholars in terms of uh, the uh, potential risks that are in the working environment. Because what we would identify, for example, is when you look at the number of fatalities. So when you drill a bit deeper, then you'll look at, you know, for example, what day of the week, what hour, what shift, et cetera. But then the other aspect, which is also something we've noticed, is the younger individuals as well. So I think, you know, we have a, we have to have a very targeted approach. And I'm seeing a lot of synergies that are coming across here uh, that we need to maybe further engage on. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll hand back to you, Ingrid. You wanted to make a comment on that. Thanks. Thanks, Santa. Apologies. Um, just to speak to Deshendra's um, point yeah. um, about adoption for contractors, digital solutions for contractors, um, some of us are biggest advocates for supporting a digital transformation to, you know, in the health and safety space, is a massive cost saving for them. First of all, you can get all your safety file approvals done prior to even getting to site from, you know, from your office. There's no waiting in, in, in queues on site waiting for someone to manually go through an entire safety file. Um, and so you can actually start to approve documents from 700 contracting companies, you know, reasons for rejections. And that company then has a transparent link to the site to actually understand where I Am I site ready? Am I business ready now? These are the requirements. It's in black and, black and white. There's accountability. There's audit trails. Um, and they can get organized prior to getting to site, which I think is really important. So, you know, it's 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 digitization for contractors is a massive cost saving. Um, we're also an engineering company, and we do a lot of engineering work on these sites. So we use our own software in order to try and manage this process. And I, I you won't look back. The minute you digitize this process, you don't look back. Ingrid, could I ask, and um, sorry, Sanjay. hijacked uh, Sanjay, how, how do we, um, so we've had, for example, contractors and uh, yeah, health and safety is not always uh, well entrenched in contractors. Um, having these systems are only, could be only as effective as the people that operate them correctly. How, how have you overcome sort of, people being able to override if the contractor doesn't have, for example, updated risk assessments or his or their employees, you know, medical surveillance hasn't been done. Is the system capable of not enabling uh, users to override and say, oh, you know, just go through, it's fine. Um, because I think that's something we do. I fully agree with you. Contractor health and safety is a massive uh, area that needs improvement. So, so if you if, if you imagine um, a a single centralized sort of data hub where you can actually see the compliance from contract A to contract Z on one platform, and one contract is, is sitting at and your priority one documents like your medical medical you know certificate has expired, number one that contract is going to be non compliant. Okay, if he then arrives to site and you've done your integration into X control system, he won't be allowed in. But also. All responsible parties can see that. The contractor can see it. The worker can see it. You know, the, the health and safety practitioner on site can see it. The corporate can see it. So there's certainly a level of transparency. And the fix is easy. Just go and update your medical check. Um, so when you, when you have transparency on a digital system, there's no really way to hide. Um, everyone's watching. Everyone is watching. Your other co-workers within your company are aware of what the compliance situation is like. So it's now there's there's a, a give and take, there's an accountability, you know, everyone starts to get involved. And what we've seen is when you adopt digitization and you actually share information like that, it drives healthy competition to be the best and the most compliant company because everyone's watching. 
um, and it becomes a positive, you know, um, enforcement. And, I, and it's it's collaboration that we were just uh, chatting, talking in the chat to someone. Collaboration here is key between all parties, and the sharing of this information is key to to the success of of zero harm. Oh, thank you, Ingrid. Sanjay. And uh, we'll move to okay, uh, Chris. One more question, uh, one more comment for me. Then we we'll move to the uh, next item. Thanks. Yes, thank you. I mean, um, I'd like to weigh in uh, on this. Uh, you know, I think the systems, processes, all of that are really good, good to have in place. Um, but maybe there needs to be more said. And 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 I think Jessica Jessica touched on it is identifying systemic issues which may lead to people getting injured, because I do agree, nobody wakes up with the intention of killing themselves. Um, and, and they may unwittingly, because of and, and our country, South Africa is a very complex environment. Uh, you know, there are so many things that uh, affect uh, potential uh, or, or affect employees. And, and how does that weigh on their minds when they go into the workplace that may, you know, lead to, to um, um, them exposing themselves unduly and sometimes even unconsciously to risk uh, because, and, and, and so I, I would want to say that maybe employers need to put more energy into employee well-being, identifying such uh, symptoms uh, in advance. Um, I mean, even our office workers, our staff these days with uh, the uh, pandemic and the post-pandemic era, uh, people think often that, hey, you know, I'm quite fine working at home. Meantime, I'm going through some serious mental uh, stresses and I'm, I'm really not coping. I'm drowning. Can somebody help me? You know, that kind of uh, situation. And, and that's not only prevalent in in an office workplace but those same kind of mental issues affect people on construction sites in mines and wherever they are so maybe the proactive identification and 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 addressing those would help prevent the need for all of these administrative processes that you know which you know at the end of the day become a record of what you had in place but the consequence of the employee uh, employee uh, getting injured um, might not have been 100% preventable. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, and to the rest of the panel. We'll now move to the Q&A. Um, and maybe we could start with the question from Richard. Uh, so on the agricultural side, what measures can be taken to reduce or improve in controlling of fire as it's fire season and there were a lot of injuries that have occurred. I'm not sure if anybody on the panel can uh, take that question. So maybe if I can, maybe if not from a construction perspective, but from a former life, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges is, especially in August, uh, parts of the country, it's extremely windy, you know, um, you know, making fires is totally discouraged uh controlled burning even becomes high risk but i am aware that in most rural environments they do have these um fire management uh agencies and i don't know how effective they are they were put in place many years ago uh and and it's probably really a, a really tricky one to to say that they preventable because all it takes is for a motorist, motorist to flick their uh, cigarette. Some people still smoke real cigarettes. Flick it out of the window and the dry grass, and and there goes uh, the the um, the countryside. So not easy, not an easy one uh, because it's not confined to a controlled burning in an agricultural environment. It could be an uh, inadvertent uh, tossing of a cigarette that doesn't go out on its own. Um, just uh, uh, by somebody on a roadside trip, so that's you know not in not a straightforward easy answer. Um, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no, thanks, Chris. I think uh, there are quite a few organisations that um, you know facilitate and and uh, 
do the firefighting, clearing of fields, etc. For example, working on fire, and, and you've heard recently they're traveling through to Canada as well, uh, representing South Africa. So I think what's a key part of it for most industries would be training, training for those particular employees, but I think for the general public as well. And you would find, for example, not just in agriculture, but if you look at the, the squatter settlements as well, during winter, we find that there's an increase in terms of uh, fires breaking out. So what we would potentially require in those particular instances is more of an advanced warning system. You know, So that's something maybe government and maybe the communities as well uh, need to implement uh, in those particular areas. But I definitely know it's a, it's a major concern where we see that burns are quite a, a, a significant cause of injuries and fatalities as well. Uh, there was a question uh, from Scott uh, to Duchenne, and uh, he wanted to find out, does the Minerals Council publish the detailed statistics on the causes of these safety issues? Yeah, so uh, thank you for that, Scott. Um, essentially, we get all of the information from the DMRE, and we can share certainly, you know, the contributing factors, um, you know, on our agency perspective or level, um, you know, to date. Um, so we got all of those uh, pie charts and the data uh, that, that we can share with you, certainly. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, from Marvin. Uh, so what is the best way to introduce a safe, a safe working way in a company where culture is more is with more old employees and and safety reactive, I would I would think, or safety related. Sorry, so I'm not sure. I think culture is quite critical, and maybe the uh, older employees, uh, maybe to get an update from that. I'm not sure, Jessica. Can you maybe answer? I was going to say I think safety culture is um, a subject that's underexplored in South Africa um, and has a huge impact. I mean, it also leads to the the following question that I think Raquel was asking about. You know, so psychosocial risk factors. So Building a culture is not something that happens over time. Um, and it's all about leading from the front. So I remember once going on site and I was accompanied by senior management and, and um, they called an employee over for not wearing their reflective vest. And I looked at the manager and I said, unfortunately, you're on the same premises as the employer and you're not wearing, you know, your your reflective vest. So you've got to walk the talk, you've got to lead by example. If 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 you want a safety culture where you want employees to really be valued, it starts with leadership. So for me, I feel um, education of, of management and leadership about, you know, the legal liability, about the, the regulations. There's not a lot of understanding about health and safety. You know, people will say, oh, yeah, you know, there's a 16.1, a 16.2, someone might go to jail if, but maybe. And that's sort of the limited understanding of the, of the legal responsibilities that, you know, are for, for senior management. So for me, safety culture is not something that's going to happen overnight, but it has to be led um, from the front. Various activities, you know, from visible felt leadership. But I think one of the ways of really creating a culture is also through communication. So if someone reports something that's unsafe and they see it again tomorrow and they see it again a week later, they eventually stop reporting it because they keep saying, well, safety is not taken seriously. So I'm going to stop reporting. If if something's reported, it needs to get fixed. There needs to be communication. There needs to be feedback um, so that people know that, you know, we're, we're, we really do value safety. We know it's important. It's not something we just, you know, tell our shareholders. So um, I'm not going to give a quick answer in terms of, of how to build a safety culture. Um, there's a lot, and I'm happy if anyone um, you know, wants to, to speak to me about that. But it's also about, do companies have wellness programs in place, uh, proper employee assistance programs, um, av av availability to, to instant support, you know, in terms of whatever psychosocial issues they have, um, you know, just making sure that people lead, by example, for me is, is, is only going to win it. Um, but yeah, happy to chat about it. Yeah, if I can add to that as well, uh, Sanjay. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. essentially, yeah, I, I would like to just, um, you know, I think uh, Dr. Jessica hit upon those key points. Um, but yeah, also to just reiterate, you know, behavioral culture is something that that requires a continuous sort of continuous improvement prerogative. You know, it's not something that's going to happen in, immediately. It, it's going to be transitionally. Um, and there's, there's many dimensions to it. You know, the MOSH process that we use it's a whole philosophy around 
um, you know, looking at the technical aspects, behavioral aspects, and leadership aspects. And I think Dr. Jessica highlighted that. Visible felt leadership is something that we promote quite strongly. And a lot of our company, uh, our mining companies are looking towards their leaders at executing that, which is being done quite proficiently. And that was one of the stop the bleeding actions to encourage visible felt leadership. Um, so there's a lot of things we can share in that space as well uh, from a behavioral point of view. Because very often you can have all of the safety uh, technical things in place, but the culture is, is, is not, it's just not meeting the requirements and, and, and incidents continue to happen. You can have such a robust uh, safety strategy, but things are just not working. And that all leans on the behavioral aspects, you know, the way, uh, the sort of culture that's been, um, you know, that, that's come, come into play in, in, on that operation. And that requires a lot of, it, it requires continuous improvement in, 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 in different areas to, to improve. Uh, so, so it's, it's, it's not a simple answer, certainly. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And I think uh, it reminds me of one of the incidents uh, that we, we had as a engineer on duty where a supervisor, you know, approached another employee and accused them of uh, potential theft and that employee then turned around and beat them up and they became an engineer on duty. But I think also it's a case where you provide instructions or these inc incidents that occur at work. It's always a case that never assume that somebody has the same sort of perception of reality as you do as well. You know, many people have... Uh, as we've mentioned, you know, psychosocial issues, mental health. And, you know, the more you drill into a, a particular incident, you know, you'd see, for example, the employee traveled, you know, hundreds of kilometers to get to work, sleeping late at night. So I think a lot more detail and analysis needs to be done uh, in terms of how incidents do occur. Uh, Ingrid, there's a question for you, right? So with the digitized health and safety file, how will site-specific risk assessments be done? Uh, how is the information then channeled to the workforce? Compliance uh, is what we want to achieve, but the intention is to share this information uh, with the workforce. Um, I just can't get to the rest of the but, answer, but uh, the question, but maybe to hand over to you. Yeah, so site-specific risk assessments are essential. Um, I mean, you know, an H second line caters for that, absolutely. Um, and we believe that when you are implementing a digital solution, health and safety, it should be inclusive. If you need access to the a specific risk assessments, where well, you're doing specific risk risk assessments, of course you're going to have access to it. You know, within within the solution, every single employee, every single piece of equipment, every asset that you actually load onto H Second Line has its own personal private QR code. That QR code can be scanned um, and prompted if it's a piece of equipment for the risk assessment that is required right then digitally, and it can be digitally signed off. Um, so. Absolutely, this information needs to be shared. Again, H Second Line is built on communication, um, transparency, and collaboration. Um, everyone gets trained on the system. Everyone is involved in making sure that the health and safety solution, you know, works for them and works for 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 the organisation. Okay, thank you, Ingrid. Uh, the next question is from previous uh, Ngopodi, and uh, the question is, is the employer allowed to allow the contractor to continue with work if the letter of good standing is expired? And I think what he's mentioned is, is the subcontractor allowed to uh, work, continue with work? So maybe I can answer this. Uh, yeah, so in terms of Section 89 of the COID Act, uh, if the main contractor has a letter of good standing, those employees are covered under his policy for COIDA purposes. If he then uh, contracts with a subcontractor on site, and if that subcontractor is a valid letter of good standing, those employees or any injuries that uh, uh, transpired thereof will fall under the subcontractor's policy from a COIDA perspective. If that subcontractor's letter of good standing expires or is not in good standing, uh, then the main contractor takes on the risk of the uh, subcontractor's employees. So any incidents will then, uh, you know, potentially fall under the main contractor's policy. So uh, definitely a high risk uh, if the subcontractor is operating with a, without a letter of standing for that matter. Okay. Um, they mostly ask for documentations that is there to be submitted physically, mainly, mainly during inductions. Uh, um, and I'm sure that maybe is for you, Ingrid. I'm not sure uh, if you could maybe answer that particular question. I'm not sure if it's clear enough. So 
It depends on um, on 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 the site, obviously, on the of the safety index um, file in terms of what documentation are required for site. But it's generally, you know, letter of good standing, medicals, um, you know, proof of expertise. If, if I'm an engineer, I need my engineering certificate, insurance. Um, you know, so those are the typical typical documentations that would need to be um, submitted during inductions. Um, physically. I don't know. Maybe someone from the the um, the, part, the the minerals council can answer the the issue with physical documents and the physical signature as opposed to a digital signature. Um, those documents, you know, sometimes are required to be there physically. Um, they're later uploaded, obviously having then been signed. Um, but maybe we can speak to that digital signature issue um, um, within the occupational health and safety rules and the mining. Um, Mining Act. Shendra, can Thanks. you can do you have any anything um, with regards to? Uh, sorry, just uh, give me some context again. I was just typing an answer to another question that I saw. So please give me some context. In some, in some cases, it, it documents need to be physically signed. Um, you know, the the DMR won't accept a digital signature on certain documents. Um, but as we moved into, you know, a more technical sort of like, you know, um, digital environment, how do we circumvent that problem? Yeah, I think in terms of um, like uh, suppliers continuing at work on site, I know the Section 21 agreements requires, um, you know, the actual signatures on, on contractual documents. Um, so in that case, I don't think they accept digital signatures. Um, it's just accepted in some cases in terms of procedures, as far as I know, but it also varies across the board. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the hard and fast rule is, is uh, you know, from a regulatory stance, it's required that that you sign on the document, original original documents. So they don't permit digital signatures, as far as I know. Okay, thank you, everybody. And, yeah. We've got Thank such you. great um, digital solutions, you know, like DocuSign or whatever the case may be, that actually are really, you know, um, working well. Is there any going to be a change to uh, yeah, they signatures could, being accepted? I think they could possibly be, you know, from an efficiency point of view. It's it's so, it makes so much of sense, you know. Um, uh, I think... You know, there needs to be a migration to that sort of thing. Uh, so, um, but I'm not sure. I'll be honest. I'll be lying to you. Uh, I'm not sure on the latest, uh, the latest on that one. Okay, thank you, uh, Ingrid. Thank you, Dushian, for that. So, we're going to start wrapping up now, uh, everybody. And uh, maybe final thoughts from you, uh, Jessica, in terms of this uh, interaction. I think, uh, firstly, to all the, my colleagues online, the panelists, and and to all the listeners, I think it's. We need more of these, certainly more engagements, more conversations. Um, I don't think we did today justice in terms of all the, the things that we've all raised. And I think we all wanted to go further, but obviously in the interest of time. Um, I think for me, it's about uh, really making sure that um, we practice what we preach. Um, health and safety is every single person's responsibility. It's not just the employees. It's not just the health and safety professionals' uh, responsibilities. Um, so as you know, leadership and management, um, we need to we need to lead by example. Uh, we need to make sure that this is something that we fully want to appreciate and entrench within organizations. I think as as a community, as a fraternity, we need to do better at working as a collective um, instead of, you know, sort of in our either in our sectors or in our industries. Um, as professionals, we need to come together. We need to share the lessons that are being learned, um, the advances that have been making in other industries, um, and also, you know, appreciating that the small medium enterprises are probably the most affected by all of these, um, you know, challenges that we face. And how do we give them the assistance and the support when they just are grappling? you know, to, to make ends meet. It's not that they don't think safety is important. They're just, you know, priorities, um, you know, are just other other necessities. So for me, I'm always happy to engage, always happy to have uh, further conversations. Um, and yeah, just really, really would like us to start working together as a collective. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, Ingrid, from your side. So yeah, I, I mean, there's a great there's a great quote by David Sarkis. He's a great safety enthusiast, 
Um, same old leadership strategies and tactics equals same old cult culture. So I would just encourage people to, you know, to, to start to digitize as, as quickly as possible. Just start. Um, and once you've started, once you've, you know, really transformed, you know, this, this very cumbersome um, sort of like manual solution into something that's really streamlined, efficient, um, accessible to everyone, you won't look back. Um, it's just a matter of starting um, to implement it. Um, you will be successful. Thank you, Thank everyone. you Ingrid. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, Chris, from your side. Um, yeah, <clears throat> so Sanjay, I think, uh, and uh, exactly um, to echo the sentiments expressed by Jessica, huge topic, way too little time. Um, and and I think certainly what is needed here is a whole lot more information, education, and collaboration. I mean, just cite the very quick examples. Uh, uh, even in the Department of Labor, there isn't enough knowledge on what is applicable in terms of the Health and Safety Act in terms of a 16.1, 16.2 appointment versus a construction site and the construction regulations. Um, and 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 that the, the kind of power play that people see has got no place in this in this environment. It's best we know that we're doing the right thing so that everybody uh, are, we're all on the same page. It's it's not a case of I'm in control and you do as I say, even if what you're saying doesn't make sense. So I think it's important, uh, you know, that we have more of the same, more of this kind of stuff, uh, educating um, as many people as possible, including ourselves, more and more. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. And then final thoughts from you, uh, Dushin. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, yeah, I quite agree with my colleagues. Need more time, but um, I think this has been great. Um, you know, from, from my side, I think for all of us, safety and health is, is really personal. Um, you know, every time I see a safety communication of, of an incident or, or anything related, um, it goes beyond the mind. It, it goes to the heart and soul. And we are very, very passionate about the work we do. We live for it. And we, we, we really want to institute measures that can improve the performance. I think that's what we, we want to gear ourselves towards. And I think we, we are making progress, just that it, safety is a journey. Safe, the safety and health performance of our sector is a journey. And I believe we're getting there with, the, with the, the way we've performed over the past 10 years. We've done a deep dive analysis, and there's been many, many good uh, progress, um, you know, informative projects that have been well uh, coordinated and, and, and well implemented for that matter. And uh, that's why we're running a learning from success, from successes mini project to see, you know, where those those core learnings can be shared. Um, and I think uh, just for the for the for the community or the colleagues also that are the people are on this call, uh, there's a wealth of information uh, that that you can look to. Um, as Minerals Council, we open to to the conversation, and uh, we have our website, but we also have the Mosh website that has a repository of information for your operations. Um, so let's keep the conversations going. Let's keep sharing. Let's keep collaborating. Um, you know, I'm very, very um, happy to to also share in some way or the other on, on some of the work we've done at the Minerals Council that's, that's also in progress. And uh, yeah, as safety thought leaders, I think uh, we need to continue these conversations and continue sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dushen, and thank you to the panelists as well. So, uh, yeah, from my side, I definitely agree that uh, collaboration and uh, synergies that can be created from this particular uh, session and looking forward to implementing solutions. I think that's what's going to be key in terms of driving um, or reducing the number of health and safety uh, incidents and injuries on sites as well. And I think as a collective, you know, in South Africa, we, of course, the most industrialized economy in the, in the, in the continent. And how do we become thought leaders as well, right? So how do we then uh, engage further with our, our, counter, uh, our colleagues in, in other countries as well? And I think to make, uh, uh, yeah, South Africa, I think, uh, progressive in terms of uh, driving health and safety uh, compliance and, and improving it, uh, across the board. So thank you so much to Klima Media as well. Thank you to attendees uh, for participating in this event as well. Hoping you found it uh, fruitful. I'll now hand over to Shannon. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sanjay. Um, that brings us to the end of our webinar. 
Um, I'd like to say thank you very much to our facilitator, Sanjay Manu, for enabling an engaging and thought-provoking discussion. Thank you also to our panelists, Jessica Hutchings from Rand Mutual Assurance, Chris Campbell from Consulting Engineers South Africa, Ingrid Osborne from Sarex Engineering Group, and Dushen Naidu from Minerals Council South Africa. Thank you to our partner, Electromining Africa, and our sponsors, Rand Mutual Assurance, Sarex Engineering Group, and Alcohol Breathalyzers for their support in making this webinar possible. And finally, thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion on health and safety in industry and mining. Thank you also to everyone who participated in our live Q&A. We have taken note of everyone's interest in this topic, so keep an eye on our website for more on this in the future. Our next webinar takes place on 21 August at 2 p.m. and will focus on women in business. The link to register for that event has been shared in the chat. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course. And if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at Thank you so much for your time. Goodbye.